Um, okay, let's uh, call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Tuesday, January 29th. Um, I guess everyone to stand, please recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The school board and Audi and stands and faces the flag. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Great souls who have come out this evening. A little chilly out there. And I see people with sweatshirts who talk about swimming. No, never too cold. Can't even imagine swimming. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, start out with roll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. Jack Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Kevin Huber. Here. Scott Luce. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. All right, so we got everybody this evening. Um, our agenda, we will have, uh, we'll open it up for public comment. Mm -hmm. We will have um, the College and Career Resource Center report, part of the educational presentation. We will not have student, oh no, we have student recognition also. Yeah, so we have both of those. Uh, we will not have student school board representative reports under the president's report. Um, we'll have superintendent's report. We'll vote on the consent vote agenda. Um, we will um, have an update from uh, facilities and finance, program and personnel, no news on property. Anything else, Cito? Just nothing. Okay. Uh, ISB, Jim? No. Nothing? Okay. And then we are going to cancel the executive session um, due to the weather and the plummeting temperatures here this evening. So the semi-annual review of closed session minutes we will take up under the superintendent's report. Okay? I think that's it. Anybody got any other comments? Okay, so let's open up anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight. The board waits. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to our educational presentation. So the student recognition. <coughs> the HHS principal, Dr. John Gilliam, steps to the podium. Good evening. Thanks. Um, Excited tonight to have members of our female swimming and diving uh, team. Last, uh, over the couple, last couple of years, we've been fortunate enough to snag two excellent people from Highland Park High School. One of them sitting out here, and the other one sitting over here. Coach Block uh, is a first year coach with us. Um, we stole her from Highland Park. It was a great steal, and uh, she has had, she and her team have had a tremendous year. I was uh, fortunate enough to see them swim a couple times, especially at Evanston for the state meet, and uh, they, they did awesome. And so we have two of the six, I think, and you said, I can't imagine swimming today. Well, I think four of them are swimming in the pool right now. Uh, but we have uh, two of the best here with us tonight, and Coach Black is going to introduce them. <coughs> Coach Block steps to the microphone. I'm not quite as tall. Um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to, to be here and to recognize um, what the girls have done. It means a lot to us. They put a lot of time and effort in, and again, they swim in all weather conditions. Fortunately, we get the fall sports, which is fall is much better than the boys with swimming in the winter. But thank you so much for taking the time out of your meeting to recognize us. It means a lot. Um, as John said, it was, a, it was a tremendous year for all of us. It was a great, I walked into a great opportunity. Um, and I had great kids to work with, and I, I feel very fortunate to be here, so thank you for that. Um, I want just to mention some of the girls that weren't able to come because they are at swim practice. Um, um, the two swimmer, the diver and swimmer that are here that I'll, I'll recognize also made an effort to do their practice and still get here, so extra credit for them for making, making it happen in both, in both ways. Um, the girls that are unfortunately not here, I'll just mention who they are because they had uh, tremendous years, a tremendous season, and they added a lot to um, to the state need and our 12th place finish, which, which is the best in school history. 12th place is really a big deal at our state meet. Um, it helps having a diver get second place, I'll tell you that. Um, that's a lot of points right there. But we had relay score and individual scores, which we've never had in the past. So it was a tremendous team effort all around. Um, so Anna Long, she was, on, she was on both of our relays. And her sister Ellie Long was also on the relay. She's a senior, we'll be missing her. Um, the other members of the 400 and 200 free relay, they were the same foursome. The, uh, the Fab Four included um, Casey also, Casey Crappy, who's going to come up here. And um, 
and Drew Petteret, who was our fourth, and she's a senior. She'll be leaving, and she'll be sorely missed also. So our two relays, the 200 free relay, the 400 free relay, free relay we got 10th and 11th, which is great, and two new school records, which was not also really nice. Um, Drew also swam in the 50 free, and she was 11th place, so that was a nice individual finish for her in her senior year. Um, and otherwise, Sasha, um, Alexandra Sasha Skachkov, we just call her Sasha, um, she placed um, 11th in the, 50, in the 105, which was also tremendous. Our medley relay missed by this much, which she was a part of. Um, and two other swimmers, which didn't make it to finals, but they got to go to prelims at state. All three relays, which is also a school first. So that was pretty exciting. Next year, they were 14th, a couple places up. Hopefully all three relays, which would be really a great feat. Um, so I'd like to call the two girls that are here and, and recognize their individual accomplishments and team. First, we have Allie Landis, who, if you don't know anything about diving, she's the one to know and she's the one to watch. She broke the school record more than once this year and she had a tremendous season. She placed second at the Illinois State Meet. That's me. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, what place were you in going into the last round? Seventh. <laughs> and that's going into her last dive. That's like clutch diving. I mean, that's when you really show your true grit, and she she is she's really a true competitor, and she did great. So school record, second place at the state meet. She can she's got one more notch up. That's it. So that's what we hope for next year. And she won conference handily and sectionals. That goes without saying. So congratulations. The two women share a hug. So happy we get one more year with her. Um, next up, we have Casey Crafty, who is an awesome swimmer in every event and every distance. She placed in 500, which I wanted to recognize also. She was 12th place in the 500. She was also a member of both relays. Not only did the relays break school records, Casey broke her own 500 freestyle record this year, going under five minutes, and that is a, like in any, any sport, four minute mile, five minute mile, five minute 500. It's a big barrier, it's a really big deal, and I think she'll go way under now that she's kind of you know, broken through that. So that was really exciting. And she's only a sophomore, so that's great too. So Casey had a great meet, and both of these girls, not only are they great swimmers, they're great students. They're all academic, all scholar, all everything. And, and we're just as proud of their out of deck, um, in school stuff as they are in the pool. So this is uh, two, of our, two of our eight actually, but thank you again. And Hopefully we'll have good news, we'll win sectionals, we'll win conference again, and place at state. It was a pretty good year, so thank you. The two women share a hug. The swimmers stand for a picture with Coach Block, Dr. Gilliam, Superintendent Prentice Lee, and Board President Pat Grudy. Okay, round of applause. <laughs> LHS Principal Dr. Tom Kulandas. Friends, if I could just uh, share that K Casey is a uh, Vernon Hills student, but she's sort of an adopted wildcat because her mom is Doreen Lemke, who is our special service yep. teacher at LHS. So, congratulations. <laughs> Superintendent Brantis Lee. Great, thank you all. And uh, as always, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the board meeting, or you can actually go home and get one. So, your choice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, um, College and Career Resource Center report. Uh, this is one I've always looked forward to. Two women with microphones address the board. Hi, hi everybody. Hello. I don't know, is this working? It doesn't yeah, really sound, it's yeah? Working okay, good. Of course, all righty. So, we are the district college counselors. Um, I'm Becky Bolito, I work in this building, and um, my story is a little different from Amy in terms of like background. I started here right out of college, and I was an English teacher, and then I got my master's in counseling, and was able to intern here, and then I was a counselor for like, 10 years before moving into the college counselor role. So I have been super fortunate to have 
um, so many different roles in one building. Um, whereas Amy, we like balance each other out because she's got a varied background for that. How many years have you been here? I think I'm on year 17. Yeah, wow. So it's been a while, wow. yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Amy Belster and I'm the college counselor at Libertyville where I have been for nine years um, in that role, but I actually can say I was adding this up the other day. This is my 31st year working in this profession, um, either on the college admissions side or on the high school side. So I actually started my career in college admissions. I did that for about 11 years. Um, I spent most of that time at University of Denver out in Colorado. And I followed that up with grad school and then working um, at a private school briefly and then at a large public school out there. But I'm from the Midwest, so I'm a good Indiana girl, actually. So um, moved back to be closer to family and uh, find myself very fortunate to be at a school like Libertyville. It was sort of the perfect place for me. So that's my background. And then um, we just wanted to highlight kind of our function in the district. And so, you know, primarily we are here as a resource <coughs> for our students and families, um, giving them information and helping them throughout um, high school with the college process. But then we're also here for the teachers and counselors. You know, teachers have to write a lot of letters of recommendation. Um, counselors get a lot of questions asked of them, and so we're a support for them, as well as for admin, even like in terms of curriculum and what colleges are looking for and what they'll accept certain courses as. We have a lot of contacts at the colleges, and so it's really easy for us to get that input from them. We have really interesting jobs, to be honest, and a lot of what we do is programming. Um, this is sort of a conglomeration of both what Becky does here at Vernon Hills and what I do at Libertyville, but we have a lot of overlap. Um, we have different student populations, so we, we work with them in different ways. Uh, just to, you can see there's sort of a lot that we do in the fall. We're now into spring semester getting ready for working with our juniors, that sort of thing. Um, we each have a couple of programs I want to call out here. Um, Becky has a college night for Spanish-speaking families that we actually advertise to our families as well, and I think that's just a, a great program to work with those students. Um, at Libertyville, we tried something new this year. We did a military interest day which for a first shot out of the door, we I was blown away by the response we got. We had students from grades nine through 12 did it the day after Veterans Day, which was really good timing. So we were excited about that. We do, we each do junior programs in the fall and we're actually getting ready for a new joint program this uh, March that Becky and I are just a little bit psyched about. We're calling it College Palooza, right on. Um, <laughs> And it's going to be here at Vernon Hills this year. We're hoping to uh, rotate it each year, a joint event. We're bringing in a ton of speakers to talk to our students and parents. Um, and we actually have a keynote speaker we're very excited about. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of the Princeton Review guidebooks. So um, his outreach coordinator, this is really a small world thing, actually is a mom of Vernon Hills kids. And he like lives in New York or New Jersey. So yeah, anyway, wild. his name is Rob yeah. Franick. We're so, super excited about that. So lots of things. All told, we probably both do 12 or 13 uh, different programs throughout the year um, in the evening, as well as, of course, lots of daytime things. So, okay. And a lot of times we go like an hour and an hour and a half. So I hope you guys are OK with that. <laughs> no, OK, no, just kidding. I got strict information. We're keeping it short, <laughs> short and sweet. It's freezing outside. Um, and then these are some additional things that work through our offices. When colleges come to meet with kids and give like brief info sessions, those are organized through the CRC. We organize our own um, internal scholarship application for local scholarships at both buildings, along with like supporting students on any other scholarship apps they have. We're always doing individual appointments reading a ton of essays um, in the fall and again during scholarship season in the winter. And then, you know, promoting the different college fairs that are out there um, either at CLC or in the city or Milwaukee. Slide, school profiles. Well, we just thought it would be interesting for you guys to see sort of our general profiles. We each publish a school profile every year that's way more detailed that actually goes into a lot of information that accompanies all of our transcripts and, and documentation that we send out to support kids' college applications. 
But um, Becky and I were just talking about this this afternoon and just how interesting it is to, you know, these are obviously two very highly college-bound communities. But it's good to compare them side by side, I think, at the same time because it really sort of highlights some of the differences um, in, our, in our two populations. But uh, I think we're both very proud of the fact that we're over 90% college bound, both two year and four year. Um, we actually hit a, a milestone at Libertyville last year, I think it was last year, um, that I'm not sure I'm happy with where 71% of our students are going out of state. Um, and that was a reflection of our Illinois economy, a lot of other things going on, and, and recognize that out of state is a few miles north. Um, sometimes it's closer to go to Madison than it is to go to U of I, but at the same time, it was, a, it was an interesting statistic for us. Um, our kids go, at both schools, go to a lot of different places. They go far afield. Um, yeah, I was gonna say if you wanna say yeah. anything about it. So we compared our colleges that are most attended, and there's a ton of overlap. So um, while by percentages it might look quite different, like our kids are applying to a lot of the same schools, getting accepted to a lot of the same schools, and this is just like a quick glance at some of the top, hit top hitters from last year's graduating class and where they attended. So I think families are always interested in that information, and really we see like one kid go somewhere different, loves it, you know, it doesn't take long before the younger friends start being interested and take a look at that school. So, which is really easy to do now that they have the internet, right? Like I couldn't look up anywhere. And so that's why you're seeing kids are all over the nation. It's really easy to get info on those places. Right. The big, we always joke that the Big Ten is very well represented in District 128. Slide, trends in college admission. And we, the last thing we wanted to do was just, <coughs> You know, we're, there's, we can talk about a lot of things, but again, uh, with the nature of time tonight, just to highlight some of the trends that are happening in, in our world. So, I think Becky was going to hit a couple. So, when seniors come back and they're like still in summer mode, I quickly jo jolt them awake, letting them know, like, well, yes, it's August, and that brings us into application season right away. Deadlines are creeping up earlier. More and more colleges are offering early decision. Um, as a binding agreement and more and more colleges are admitting a good portion of their classes through early decision which um, just to be clear early decision is a commitment from the student and the family saying if I get accepted here I will attend here and they have to sign something and we're seeing that be more and more um, of interest to our students as they see that students are that schools are filling their freshman class like a good chunk through the early decision pool. Um, and that's very stressful, or that's one of our bullet points here. You know, but even for kids that aren't going the early decision route, there's priority deadlines that are November 1. And these applications take a lot of time and every college wants something different in a different way and so it's just a lot to juggle and so a lot of our job is just like supporting students through how complicated and confusing that process can be in the fall and just like trying to keep everyone um, calm and just knowing the right next step. Um, for testing, you know, more and more colleges are actually starting to go test optional. A big one this fall was uh, University of Chicago said that they would be um, open to students not sending a standardized test score, that that was a piece that if the student wished to submit it, they could, but it wasn't nece necessary. And that's just a reflection of more and more colleges realizing that a test on one day is not a good indicator always of future success at college. And so um, the essay, they you know, made a big deal, I think like 10 or so years ago, about adding the essay component to standardized tests. There's only like 13 schools or so yeah. that actually require that. Um, subject tests very rarely require. And a lot of um, colleges are allowing students to self-report their scores, which is nice for um, financial reasons that kids aren't having to pay um, for each test score that they want sent to each college. Once they decide where they're gonna go, they have to send the official score to verify that they didn't just make up that they got you know, their score. But it's like, um, you know, 
they would do so jeopardizing their admission. So it's to provide more access to students that maybe like financially it would be limiting to um, have to send a score to 10 different places, for example. Well, on, on, on that note, actually talking about self-reporting, I'm going to skip to the next bullet. We're, we're finding more and more colleges are allowing students to self-report their, their transcripts, essentially their grades and classes on the application and not send an actual official transcript. That's a wave that's going to continue to, um, I think, grow because I, I would not be surprised at all if in five years the majority of colleges are doing that. So just some interesting trends that are happening. Uh, because of all the confusion and uh, because of all the different options out there, the, we spend a lot of time just calming down students and parents and letting them know it's all going to be okay, your child's going to go to college, you're going to go to college, um, it, this is all going to be okay. But as with any school district, um, our kids are very brand name conscious. They're looking at certain types of schools. They're very hopeful. Um, and they just continue to apply to more and more colleges. So. We're constantly trying to let them know it's all going to be okay, that you're going to land, it's going to be fine. And then finally, there's just some interesting developments happening in our world as well. Um, you might be familiar with uh, the Harvard case that you know they have had a suit brought against them about um, discrimination in their admission process, and it's sort of bringing back that affirmative action argument that is affirmative action really appropriate or not. Um, we also belong to an organization we'll tell you about that is a national organization of high school counselors and college admission professionals. They are under investigation by the Department of Justice. For We're not even 100% sure why, but we think it has to do with deadlines. So um, just weird things are happening in our world, and uh, it's got everybody kind of on edge. <laughs> Yeah, and these are some of the organizations that we participate in, and so um, we're very lucky that our district is supportive of us being, um, you know, very involved with these different organizations, IACAC, NACAC, College Board, and then different advisory boards for colleges. Colleges a lot of times want to get feedback on um, how they're handling their business through a um, high school college counselor's eyes. And so Amy, I think, has a meeting next week, a conference call with one of those colleges, you know, to give some of her feedback. Um, IACAC, you know, I, um, the past two summers have been lucky to go on what's called the bus o fun or the plane o fun tour and it's basically a group of counselors and college counselors from illinois who tour 12 to 14 colleges in six days and it's like the best workout of my life so but it's an invaluable professional development experience and there's no substitute for that and um you know we go to the NACAC conference every year and She's she not telling you that she's going to be coordinating that bus trip. I just year. try not to think about it. Yeah, somehow <laughs> they got me to say yes, I would plan it. So I am planning a tour for like 44 counselors and I'm really bad with math. My husband couldn't believe that I got this job. I'm like, I don't need to know how to get there. I just need to know where to go. So. That's pretty awesome that Becky's getting involved at that level. Um, and we both have done a variety of things within these organizations. So um, it's, again, it's great to be supported to do this um, and to also grow ourselves professionally because uh, we find immense resources through these organizations. So I think that was, that was our main things we wanted to highlight for you and just see if you had any questions, anything you wanted to ask of us. Yeah. Um, I am curious about like when you have students, and I'm guessing it's a fairly small percentage that are doing like performance-based college admissions. So, for instance, in the you know, music, music or music, yeah. Is that something that they come to you for guidance? Do so they go to the, or the department and find out? So they yes, um, <laughs> both. Yeah, yeah, honestly, yeah. I think it's. Anytime students are looking at really competitive programs like that, be it in dance, music, theater, um, any of the visual performing arts, it's kind of a team effort. Um, certainly, I think Becky and I help them with that, but they have to either have portfolios or auditions, and that's where their individual teachers can really be a resource to them as well. I, I 
my uh, youngest did this before your time. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> curious what, yeah. how that's changed because I don't, I think he pretty much did it kind of on his own, which was actually great. He That's awesome. If he, yeah. But but I'm sure you know. I just didn't know if he knew that he could go and get help at the time, and didn't. You know, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I we wondered if that changed because there. we have so many students that are going on. To oh, for sure. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think you know, just even knowing to t to guide families from the beginning, if they're talking about that, like hey, your application process is going to look a little different yeah. and you need to get a head start yeah. on that because for some colleges you're going to have to apply to the college and then also to the music mm -hmm. department, for example, right. and right. you're going to have to set up an audition right. and just, right. you know, so I think the teachers are also good at communicating that because a lot of times they're the first line of defense in terms of knowing which students are really passionate about pursuing that. But then, um, you know, I had to sit last year on the phone with a college um, in the performing arts department, you know, with a student to try and navigate a difficult circumstance, you know, that she wasn't quite sure what was going on, I wasn't, and like we got the answer together, so. That's neat, I'm glad to hear. I, yeah. you know, I just, um, they have such great um, kids that are coming out of our oh, school. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and they, uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. And we promote, like, there's a college fair now. I don't know if there was when you were child, but there's a performing arts college fair that's offered um, at UIC a lot of times in the fall. And so we will <coughs> send that out to families just so that they can check out that college fair that's well, specific they, to that interest. Yeah, and they have, like, the unified auditions where mm -hmm. yep. you, know, you yep. can do a lot, yep. a lot of your auditions together. That was just new territory for us, you know, because we hadn't gone through that. Right, so we, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we, we help, st if, if they come to us, we are happy to do that. We're, we're absolutely happy to help them with it. Yeah? Um, so uh, this is all one of my favorite topics, actually. I, I know you're saying to friends, I want to see a presentation on this. And here because, you are, I mean, yes. imagine that. <laughs> but, but I mean, the reason that is every time I go by the College Resource Center, the need of school, they're always busy, there's a lot of activity. In fact, I think I was in LHS one day and I walked by and I love the board that had all the visitors coming from all the colleges. It must have been in the fall. And I saw there Fairfield University, and I'm like, Fairfield University, like, that's where I grew up in Connecticut. Like, yeah. And they're coming to LHS, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, but I guess I'd ask you two questions. So when the visitors from all the colleges come, you know, I would imagine they give you some feedback of some kind, I would hope. Um, and I'd ask you, you know, what do they say? And, and in particular, do they say good things? And, and are there any things they say where they say, hey, you know, this is an area where, hey, this is what we're looking for, you got to beef that up. So you're saying feedback about, like, D128? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They were very well respected as, as, as a district, as two high schools. Um, we probably see somewhere around 200 colleges every fall-ish. Um, and yes, it, it's always interesting to me to see who's going to come in um, every year. New Trier's gonna have a few more than that, that's totally okay, but at the same time, the colleges are really looking at all the northern suburbs to, to recruit students. Their feedback is always very positive. Um, and we always have good conversations with them, but one of the things we always hear is your kids are very well prepared, they do very well. Uh, we hear that from the students themselves that they come back and tell us that, yeah, I did, I did good, I was ready, I was ready. Sometimes I love it when they come back and go, shoot, it was easier than high school. And I'm like, just you wait, <laughs> that's gonna change. Yeah, and I think like they always um, are so pleased when our students are inquisitive during those visits and you know you said you love this topic like I think it's great because it's pretty easy to get a captive audience when you're talking about college if that's something that's remotely on your radar and so um, but when our students come and meet with those reps like I've had multiple reps afterwards be like that group was like lively and they you know like it wasn't just like every other visit or they're asking the right <coughs> questions or they you know just they're impressed with our students even just from a conversational standpoint. We have very collegial relationships with our, our we're friends with our, our admission reps. It's a, it's very much a team effort. We all belong to the same organizations, you know, professional organizations that we showed and um, we support each other. We bring them in to talk to the kids for programs and uh, they utilize us in lots of different ways too. And then just one other real quick question. I mean, and, and you kind of touched on it. You know, if more, if somebody, if people are going to do cheering and not going to hear, 
you know, I kind of want to know why. So I guess my question would be, yeah. is there anything so <laughs> more we could or should be doing from our own brand recognition standpoint that might make them stop here before they go to the jury? So, to be honest, I think, I so. yeah, no, absolutely. I, it's not that we're doing anything different. They, they have um, a little bit more name recognition in that, but you are doing that by supporting us to go out there and be sort of the face of D128 at the national organizations or national yeah, conferences and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Becky is you know, starting to get very involved with IACAC, which is wonderful. I just rolled off as a chief delegate, um, so I was sort of rounding up our Illinois delegates that go to the NACAC assembly to vote on measures, vote in our executive board, that kind of thing. Um, I've sat on a national committee. That helps to get just, name, people are like, oh, Libertyville, you know, oh, Vernon Hills. It's a, it's a good way for us yeah. to represent that out there. So that involvement's important to us, but it's also important, I think, to the district. Yeah, and I think like the fact our teachers support students attending the college visits is really helpful too because, yeah. um, you know, sometimes, they're only there for like 45 minutes, and so if it's during a kid's class and that's a college they're very interested in, um, that's important face time with it. And so, um, you know, I think if students didn't show up for these appointments, that would make reps be less inclined to mm -hmm. continue to sign up. But um, I think it just continues to grow. And as one student attends a school that's never visited here, then like this year, you know, Georgia Southern stopped in and we had never had them visit and like four kids showed up to talk to Georgia Southern. So part of it is just, um, you know, the way of like what students are talking about and their interests. So. Yeah, that's great. And the last comment I'll make, I promise I will quit here. Because <laughs> um, I, I, I really see these roles as key conduits with these universities too to make sure that we know where they're thinking and where they're headed. Um, because I, I think this is just going to continue to evolve, evolve, and, and that landscape is going to continue to get more and more challenging. So, I mean, I, I'm just really grateful for everything you guys do, and, you know, it's, it's great to have you here and, and to learn firsthand more about it. So, Just uh, one quick comment. So, fresh out of this, two girls through it, as you know, in the last two years. Yeah. If you can get Sean through it. He's <laughs> 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 always saved the best for last. No, 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 Listen, I... But listen, I, I've seen what you guys do. I have great admiration and respect for what you do. You, you know, you got the support of the board and, and of the administration. You just keep doing it. And if you need something you don't have, let us know because what you do is outstanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I feel very supported. So I do have a question, actually. So I am. Could be. <laughs> so I am I'm cursed enough to be chairman of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. So obviously the out migrations bothersome to us yeah. Yeah. as well as Springfield. Yeah. What you showed us numbers, I think you were fifty one percent in state, I think you're yeah. fifty one forty nine. You were like twenty Yeah, it was it was bad. Right. I assume those trends are actually going the wrong way. Well, so what we're seeing now is it's spinning back. So when you know the recession hit, and there was a lot of bad media press about right. you know Illinois schools and the, the cost and just a lot of stuff. It was, it and was, it was budget concerns. It was budget. Right? I mean, you know, parents you know, the were saying, is, "Will Illinois, will Eastern Illinois University be in existence?" In exactly. Two years? And parents were saying, "Been in Charleston forever." I mean, that question's been asked on. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. They it, parents were actually saying to me in my office. I'm worried about sending my kid to an Illinois school because we don't know what's going to happen. And it's hard to say, oh, it's going to be okay, because we were all worried, right? And, and it was a natural, there's some cachet for a student to be able to say, well, I went to school out of state. Mm -hmm. And all of our out of state, especially our contiguous states, they got very savvy at offering scholarships or reductions in price to rival Illinois in-state prices. So it, there were a lot of competing factors in there. But what we're seeing now, you know, for example, um, U of I has instituted the Illinois Promise uh, to help under-resourced students find it more affordable, right? And even though 
we may not have a huge number of kids who qualify, we do have kids who qualify. And that's gonna make a huge difference in their world. Because I don't know if you're all familiar, but they're, I'm not gonna remember every single criteria, but if the family has high financial need, um, good grades is admitted essentially, uh, shows a zero EFC on financial aid. So that's, that's Pell eligible. Um, they can qualify for full tuition at U of I. And other in-state colleges are offering similar programs to I was, also. I had a student come to me. Um, UIC has, they, is it the AIM High or is AIM it? High. Yeah, AIM High is the initiative in Illinois to try and recruit some of our excellent in-state students to stay in-state. And UIC um, decided to handle their money as like a way to recruit the best of the best and offer like a smaller number of students full tuition and I talked with one of our um, seniors who was just offered that you know and so she's feeling pretty good where she sits right yeah, now yeah. that like yeah it's right I mean that's huge yeah it is so I think that you know <coughs> the pride of earning like a scholarship whether it was from out of state or in state like that sways students mm -hmm. um, but a lot of these out-of-state schools were making the cost similar with price reductions, but I do see like, you know, last year we had um, a ton of kids, like our top three schools at Vernon Hills, I believe were, um, well it was CLC, U of I, ISU, and um, University of Illinois in Chicago. So that was like pretty noticeable, um, and I do agree with Amy that that's like kind of where it's trending. Uh, so. that's what yeah, the, everyone's no. super excited about like, you know, hearing this money and like automatically qualifying for this Illinois one, for example. Yeah, thanks for the aim high, because we, we just actually put that one in place. I'm just thinking 25 million, this college have to match it, and things yeah. of like, you know, that nature. So I'm glad that's actually having a little bit of, for sure. in fact, and I assume none of our kids really are in the map area. We really don't do a lot with map. Uh, no, yeah. they, we, I have that, absolutely. Yeah, we have kids who qualify, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So we're trying to get so, money there as well. Absolutely, we'll absolutely. Dollars. Yeah, so we have a lot of families that we offer a financial aid completion workshop to families so that, you know, um, if families are halfway through and stumble upon a question, the ISAC reps come in and will be available one night to help answer those questions on an individual basis. And we stress, like, to get their financial aid done because the MAP grant can run out. And so I have a lot of parents that, like, think sometimes even, like, do I need to do it on October 1st? Like how urgent is it? And because there is, um, there are a lot of students who are qualifying for that grant. So you're getting what you need from ISAC, yes? Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin and I have talked about this before. The stability in the state financially will help greatly because we will not have the rumors about Eastern and Western and Southern and consolidating all the colleges into just a couple. Mm -hmm. ISU, same thing. So that, I think, will help greatly. And that um, the message coming out of Springfield will be a better message. You'll have, a cons Kevin, you guys should have consistent funding for what you do, uh, et cetera, and for the grants and the MAP grants and all of that. So that should help, and that's all good news. I just want to say, really, to our community at home, that um, these two women in their roles in the district are one are two of the true value adds of District 128. Okay, you may not know, but most school districts do not have full time Amy's and Becky's. Okay, uh, this district was has been on the cutting edge for a number of years uh, with this before I ever walked in the door uh, in the district, and um, Amy and and Becky just keep that tradition not only alive but growing. And for our parents, when they start offering sophomore parents the opportunity to come in and start learning about college, those evenings are amazing. And they are so helpful having sat through them as parents. And then your junior year, and then you're you know, kind of right at the beginning of the senior year. All those evenings and the programs they present are, are very helpful. And then all the daily work they do with kids. I'm sure, Scott, your two kids, John's got two that are in college now, you know, that went through Vernon Hills. But I can tell you that Amy was instrumental with both of my girls, my older daughter, small liberal arts college, okay, in very specific areas. And my younger daughter wanted kind of a medium-sized state university. 
and their ability to help them refine a list of five or six working schools was invaluable in their college search. And I know that they do that for virtually every parent they talk to. And when parents show up and they have a list, their kids have a list of 31 schools they want to go visit and go to, Amy will tell the whole audience, you need to narrow that list. That's very helpful for parents to hear that. So you are truly value add for this district. You do incredible work. Um, we're happy to support you. The board has just told you, which they don't even tell us, by the way. If you need anything, just ask. Okay, yeah, so I'm sitting here going, okay. yeah, you better you know put your list together because they <laughs> mean that uh, now. But we so appreciate all the work um, that you do, and it's just a great resource for our kids and parents in the district. So thank you for everything you do. Lots of students today talking about wanting to go to like Arizona State, right? Aim <laughs> <laughs> hey, high. I'm, I'm going with it. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank All right, you. thank you. Okay, uh, there, because we have no students, school board rats, there's really nothing on the president's report, right? Before, so we'll break the superintendent's report. Okay, well, uh, yeah. Given the yeah. really inclement weather outside uh, this evening, we are going to, and there's no student uh, board reports tonight, we're also going to skip the good news report and we will double up and pick that up next month um, so we can continue to move along this evening uh, and uh, uh, finish at a reasonable time. Um, as the board is aware, um, if you guys can pull the community connection slide up for us, uh, as the board is aware, as part of our overall communication in the district, uh, we sent uh, postcards out to roughly 25,000, Mary, or uh, ish, um, uh, taxpaying addresses uh, in, in the school district uh, for two reasons, um, you know, before the winter holiday, late November and early December. Uh, one, to uh, communicate upcoming programs and opportunities to engage with the district and the board on our new capital projects but also uh, to give our public some additional knowledge and opportunities to connect with the district. So um, we, um, Mary's been tracking numbers and, and we've actually had maybe 40-ish uh, folks sign up um, to get additional information from us, just down to taxpayer with no kids in school. And so they will now get uh, all the information that you get as parents, uh, EPAW prints, the e-board briefs, um, all of that, but the other thing, um, in uh, the paw prints that come out Friday before our school board meetings or our committee meetings, there's a notice at the top of the paw prints that says, you know, we're going to have a board meeting on Tuesday, January 29th. Here is how you connect to the documents. You click on, and you can go right to the documents. So they will get everything that the board will get um, in their package uh, moving forward. So it's just an additional way, and uh, we think what we'll do uh, it's probably the beginning of next year. We'll do that again, uh, just as an opportunity for more community uh, people. Of course, with our parents in the district, we offer that as part of the registration process, and they're kind of inundated with that. But for uh, the community at large, and they will have an opportunity to stay kind of current connected, and then they will get all the uh, other additional news about the district and uh, the board briefs uh, following the board meeting. So we think that's a good thing, but we just wanted to highlight that for the community tonight may not know that, um, and uh, they still have the opportunity to connect with us, and uh, if they've lost their card or whatever, they can just give us a call and we can uh, connect up. Um, so, um, any questions or comments, Kevin? All right, so again, we sent out 25,000, we had about 40, give or take, 40, 50, a I small number, right? Very small number. I think it's a little bigger now, okay. especially Every time it snows, we get more people interested <laughs> every year. <laughs> I have about 70 new friends on Twitter from hey. the district, but um, yes, a small. It, it's a small, it's a yes. small number, but how many people actually get EPOP? I mean, this document, because all the parents get it. There's over 5,000. 5,000. We're pushing about 5,500. So 5,500 people, give or take, yes. get our board meeting materials, get notice of our board meetings, with everything that could possibly be discussed, if they have any interest. So I think that's actually, yeah, that, that's, again, the 50 or 100 out of 25,000 seems small, but let's be clear, five, over 5,000 people have the opportunity to weigh in at board meetings if they so choose. I think that's just always important, something important to remember when we hear that, oh, we don't know, so thank you, by the way, for pointing that, that out. I think that's 
that's a great yeah. great thing you do right there in terms of good thank giving you, them Kevin, and, and yeah. credit to Mary for her work on you know communication behind the scenes and also know that of course we've got you know a large Facebook contingent we have a large Twitter uh, contingent as we push information out so you know we work across all those platforms and really Mary coordinates all of that for us and plans that so we appreciate the work obviously and I know the board does it Mary does on, on all of the apps. Uh, Pat, you were going to say something, I think. No, no, I was, I was good. That's good. Okay. Good job, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up on the superintendent's report is LHS and VHHS major capital projects. And before we do anything with the projects that haven't moved forward yet, I want Mark, uh, I'm going to ask Mark if there's any update on the swimming pool. Hard to think about that right now. Uh, so the temperature is dropping outside like a rock, but um, I'm sure there is some update on the swimming pool. Mark? Okay, I'll make it brief. Um, the uh, face brick installation on the north wall of the uh, pool has been completed, um, and we've moved to the east side, which is the last side. Um, the equipment's been brought in, the large equipment, so now we've uh, started the mason work um, on the east side of the building, which is the last <coughs> section that we need to do to complete uh, the exterior section. Um, uh, we've been, uh, <coughs> They've also moved inside and are doing interior masonry work uh, on the colder days. So we're working outside and inside. Um, we completed overhead uh, ductwork uh, over the mezzanine area down to where the elevator uh, will be at the uh, west end of the building. Um, so we can transition into the wall and around that elevator shaft. Um, they're um, working on insulating, finishing the insulation uh, around that ductwork. They've completed all the raceway installation for the electric up uh, in the ceiling areas. And um, uh, we actually, uh, they completed pouring the north side uh, pool deck and a portion of the east side. And next week they're uh, working to pour uh, more deck uh, around on the um, south side of the, of the pool. Good. Any questions? And then our goal would be of course, as long as weather cooperates, we'd be at our February committee meeting uh, to put on our hats and take a walk in and let's take a look around uh, at the pool. Not ready to jump into yet, Scott and Kevin, but you know <laughs> that that's coming in the spring. We'll put our ice skates on. Yeah, <clears throat> it's coming in the spring. So you okay, Mark. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, next up in the agenda in a few minutes, we are going to uh, recommend uh, to the board that uh, we you authorize us to go out to bid on our capital projects, but I want to do a couple of things again uh, tonight really for maybe our community since our board meeting is taped. Um, going back to before the holiday, uh, we planned uh, two standalone meetings uh, for the community to come in and hear the plan, interact with us, and ask uh, questions. Uh, the first one was held on Tuesday, December 11th at 7 p.m. at the BHHS Studio Theater. The second one was held um, on Tuesday, December 11th at 7 p.m. at the LHS um, the studio theater. Um, we had two boards, board members as primary kind of spokespeople with us. Uh, several other board members attended as community members um, on those forums. In January, uh, we had our board uh, committee meetings in, uh, on Monday, January 14th. Tonight, we're having a board meeting um, with us on the topic. And then before the board actually votes to authorize the wording of the bids, which would really obligate us to then move forward, we have two more meetings in February. On Monday, February 11th at 5.30 uh, are our committee meetings, and then on Monday, February 25th at 7 p.m., uh, we have our regular board meeting, which may, depending on how the uh, bidding uh, goes and the bids get out, uh, may be the night that we um, actually ask you, recommend you uh, to accept the bids and, and begin to move that process forward. Uh, but as we discussed the committee, it um, just for timing's sake, it may be early the next week um, at a special board meeting. So once again, uh, we sent 25,000 postcards out uh, with those dates on them in uh, both communities. And I would say between the two, we probably had 50 people-ish uh, show up from the community. We were asked some good questions. We had some good comments. We had some good follow-up with folks. Um, you know, uh, emailing and, and talking to people after the scenes. But those meetings, I think, were very worthy, uh, and it was a good thing for uh, us to do as a district. So the other thing I want to cover before we make a recommendation tonight is, is really our FAQs on 
uh, capital plans. So what work is being proposed and why is it being proposed? The District 128 Board and Administration have been assessing and reviewing long-term Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School capital needs for approximately five years. In the past few years, the Board has completed assessment, prioritized needs, and reviewed options to meet those needs. All current and or proposed projects will be paid for from existing <coughs> cash reserves and will require no borrowing on uh, behalf of the Board. The highest priority was replacing the current or soon to be old LHS pool and adding more on-campus parking. With significant current cafeteria needs at Vernon Hills High School and continued rising enrollment, expanding the student cafeteria, adding classrooms and a STEM lab, and adding a second gym became our highest priorities there. Based on current rising enrollment and future enrollment projections at Vernon Hills, the board is considering a conservative approach to the addition of classrooms with future options to add more classrooms if and as needed. At LHS, the planning would, complete, uh, would include the completion of the new uh, swimming pool, which had been previously approved and, as we just discussed, is under construction. The work is expected to be completed on the LHS swimming pool sometime in the spring of 2019. The parking lot addition, again, already approved and uh, already under construction and will be completed when the weather breaks. An additional 68 parking spots on the west side of the property were approved by the board and the Village of Libertyville. These additional spots are much needed for the LHS campus. And finally, at LHS, repurposed the current soon-to-be-old pool, um, which is under consideration uh, tonight. Uh, will provide a multi-purpose physical education and extra extracurricular facility. This building and space at LHS is important for both curricular and extracurricular needs. At Vernon Hills High School, expand the cafeteria, again under consideration. The existing cafeteria is at least half of the size it should be for a high school the size of Vernon Hills High School. As a result, the cafeteria space must be expanded into the front lobby and the lunch periods are scaled back to only 22 minutes in length currently. The expanded cafeteria and remodeled servery area will be able to better accommodate the current and expected increase in students. Next at Vernon Hills, eight classrooms in a STEM lab. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. That is also under consideration. Analysis of classroom usage at Vernon Hills was completed to determine the current and future needs for classroom space. The proposed new STEM lab and classrooms will be able to accommodate both changing curriculum needs and increasing enrollment. And finally, at Vernon Hills, a second gymnasium, combination, dance studio. Currently, Vernon Hills High School has the same curricular and extracurricular programs as Libertyville High School. And as such, it has the same space needs. The second gymnasium and dance studio will be able to accommodate all of these needs and provide for increasing enrollment. So what are the costs for each campus and the cost overall? At LHS, already approved by the board and under construction, the new LHS swimming pool and the LHS uh, parking lot addition, the total for both of those projects is $22.5 million. Under consideration is repurposing the current or old LHS swimming pool at a total estimated cost of $5 million. Total estimated cost for all projects at Libertyville, $27.5 million. At Vernon Hills High School, under consideration, expansion of the cafeteria, addition of eight classrooms and a STEM lab, in addition of a second gym. Total estimated cost for all projects at Vernon Hills, 26.6 million. When will the work start and when would it be completed? If approved by the board, projects work would be bid uh, at the end of January with bid awards at the end of February or early March. To hit applicable construction cycles, project work would begin late spring at both campuses. Tentative project completion dates are projected to be LHS Spring 2020 and Vernon Hills in Fall of 2020. How will the projects be funded? Uh, they will be funded from 100% cash reserves. There will be no referendum and no increased taxes to fund these projects. In addition, since we are not borrowing money to fund the projects, there will be no bond interest payments. What is the impact on our current cash reserves? Our current cash reserves are roughly $80 million. The total of both of the projects, at all of the projects at both of the schools is $54.1 million. 
which leaves uh, $25.9 million in cash reserves. That's 30% of fund balance as a percentage of operating expenses. The state of Illinois recommends a minimum of 20% cash reserves. 25, I'm sorry. Yes, we corrected that, didn't we? Uh, it's 25% uh, cash reserves. So that would just put us just over uh, the level that the state actually recommends. Does the board plan to build the cash reserves up again? Or in other words, are we going to start planning now to have $80 million back in reserves at some point? The board is committed to leveling the cash reserves around the 30% level, or in other words, maintaining the reserves around that level. There is still a great deal of uncertainty in Illinois around school financing and funding including the percentage of state funding going to public education, potential pension cost shift from the state to local districts, and the possibility of a property tax freeze. After years of discussion by several iterations of the school board, the board has consensus around the 30% cash reserve level. Finally, the past few and current boards have committed to not use cash reserves to pay for regular operating expenses. And if you follow our board meetings, over the course of the year, you will hear that, hear that restated on a number of occasions. So finally, what's the potential impact to taxpayers of the proposed projects? There is no tax impact. District 128 has no outstanding debt, and there is no debt incurring to pay for these projects. Thus, also, there are no interest payments, which can be, as Dan has pointed out a number of times, can be substantial um, over the long term. So those are really, kind of, that's kind of the overview of the FAQ of the highlights that we did in our community uh, presentations. Um, I do want to make one other comment about dance in the district because there were a few, just a few comments made uh, about dance in the district and expending district dollars. Um, working with our folks at the building, we um, captured some numbers at both of the buildings in the dance programs. And remember, dance is a curricular activity under our, our PE curriculum, and it's also a very vibrant co- and extracurricular activity at both of the buildings. So in physical education at LHS, there are 233 students in dance. We have five sections of dance and 154 students and three sections of yoga and Pilates at 79 students. In co- and extracurricular activities at LHS, uh, approximately 161 students. Cheerleading, 43, Palms Team, 35, Orcasus, 45, and the Fall Musical. Total student physical education and co- and extracurricular dance-related participants at Libertyville, 394. Uh, we should note also that LHS is required to cap the number of dance-related sections in its physical education program due to lack of available space and safe space to expand the program. At Vernon Hills in physical education, there are 142 students five sections of dance, 142 students. In co- and extracurricular activities, 152 students, cheerleading 31, dance team 36, orchestras 50, and the fall musical 35. Total VHHS uh, student physical education and co- and extracurricular dance related participants, 294 students. VHHS is not able to offer yoga, Pilates fitness, or total body fitness in its physical education program due to lack of available and safe space. So total District 128 student physical education and co- and extracurricular dance related participants equals 688 students or 20.8% of the total District 128 student enrollment. Dance is substantial in District 128 and both at Vernon Hills with repurposing or Libertyville repurposing the current pool um, will provide uh, dance facilities and at Vernon Hills as part of uh, creation of the second gym will also create um, dance facilities. And the last thing we'll mention tonight is something that we talked with with the board uh, before. For years our dance kids have been nomads in our buildings. Uh, they have practiced in areas that uh, are really not suitable for dance, often carpet on concrete uh, or flooring, often in areas that ceiling height is not high enough for them to be able to uh, work on throws and jumps uh, moving forward. And as we've reviewed this plan, we have talked about the fact that, you know, we have an obligation under Title IX, uh, federal Title IX uh, legislation, uh, to make sure that we are providing, um, you know, uh, safe and comparable facilities for our dance kids uh, in the district. And our plans certainly address 
uh, those issues as well. So with that said, and with the projects that uh, I have mentioned tonight, uh, we are recommending to the board that you authorize us to um, go out to bid on uh, the projects, the remaining projects as noted tonight, at Libertyville and Vernonville High Schools. Okay, so let's start and just ask for a motion to authorize um, a bid on the major capital projects when the report is listed, and then we'll open it up for further discussion. I authorize, or I move to um, vote on and accept the uh, bids on the major capital projects. To, uh, to authorize. To authorize, to authorize the bids on the major capital projects as described by Dr. Lee. I Sorry. second. Oh, go ahead. Now, any further discussion? What? Anybody? I, I'm yeah. really excited about the plans and uh, give you a lot of credit, as well as your entire staff. Yeah. Uh, there Great has job. been countless hours on behalf of several committees, teams, employees to really uh, get this off on the right foot uh, and do it right from the very beginning. So um, I'm very excited to see uh, the bids come in and very excited to uh, potentially get started on this. And I hope that the people watching this, if they're watching the video at home, uh, don't get the impression that, you know, that we're, we're somehow not interested in this. We've spent a number, a lot of hours, years, numbers of meetings, yeah, literally years of discussion on on uh, these topics and had uh, some, some quite in-depth conversations. And, uh, I, too, am excited about getting these projects rolling. And thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Jim. Um, again, great uh, teamwork as we always do in the district. Lots of people working on this, and uh, we want to thank the board. Uh, this is something that we have been actively talking about for over five years. Um, and um, you know, at, at some point, we pushed that conversation along uh, to get to a point where we could actually do some decision making on what we were going to do. Um, and we would be remiss for everyone in not mentioning that along the way. The board abated $18.5 million to taxpayers, meaning they didn't, did, did, did not collect $18.5 million of debt under law that district could have collected. Uh, and that's all part of this discussion, too, uh, as we move forward. That put us in a position to pay off our bonds, you know, pay ourselves the interest, um, get rid of that bond obligation to be in a position we can look forward. So. Can I ask a question, Prentice, sure. along those lines? I think um, there have been comments from community members over the years who have said, uh, reduce my taxes or write me a check if there's a surplus. Right. The, the only way for us as a district to affect that is to abate. Is that correct? That would be correct. Because there would be no mechanism. Right, to write a check. To write right. a check. Right. And the way that those taxes are abated and spread out is not our choice. That's done by the county. Is that correct? No. Well, I think... How, well, how is that abatement spread out among the community? I think I know what you're asking. So, it's essentially, with the, abatement, the abatement just negates the levy that was already put in place. So, when the, when, the, when the referendum was passed and that debt was incurred, um, that, was le that was levied against all of the existing property owners at that time. Um, as an abatement comes in, basically says, you know what, don't... Like, even though we did file this and say levy this amount, don't do that. Reduce that levy by X amount. So um, that gets spread <coughs> whatever year that happens um, equitably amongst all the taxpayers based on their equalized assessed value of that year. Thank you. So that's how we sort of, right. because we can't write a check to taxpayers, that's how we affect that. Yeah. So, so again, there, and we had discussions on this, um, quite extensive discussions, and including whether or not there was a vehicle to write a check. Okay? Yes, right. and, and there was not. Okay, um, and so the two things that we had to consider, um, <coughs> one was to abate the property, or I'm sorry, the, the bond and interest levy, okay, which eventually was gonna go away, all right? <coughs> so it, it was really chosen that way because we didn't have to worry about continuing to raise revenue for those kinds of expenses, okay? If we did that for our, I'll call it the main part of our levy, all right, so let's say, and I'll just make up a number, if our levy was typically $50 million and we decided we wanted to abate some money there, 
Well, the problem is then our base becomes 45 million and our ability to increase that going forward is capped from 45. So in it, subsequent years, we're not able to recapture no. that if there is if you reduce I mean, that's, the a, regular that's a simplistic, that's a simplistic yeah. sort of picture yeah, of what that is, but in essence, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, another way maybe to, to look at that, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe this is a simplistic way to look at it as well, the way in which we went about this abatement actually had a greater impact on our reserves, where if we abated the operating fund, it would have an impact on programs. And we wanted to impact the reserves in order to well, it would, have a, it would have an impact on programs in, in the future. In the future, okay. right. But it had the, the most immediate impact because we were then able to pay off, you know, not only abate, but pay off that, that same uh, bond issue. And, and, and it seems to me, and maybe I'm oversimplifying, that it had a more direct and more immediate impact on the reserves versus on the operating funds. So for I mean for example, if 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 our levy was fifty million dollars a year and, and we could actually abate ten million dollars of that and say in any given year we're gonna only take forty million and not take ten million from the for the taxpayers, if the following year we could bring it back to fifty, well that might have made that a, a, a viable vehicle to do it. But okay. the state With law the doesn't tax have any caps, it doesn't we can't figure out a route. Right. So that was really why that, that wasn't done, okay? That's helpful, thank you. I would like to make one comment too, because I know it's been reported in the press about the district and hoarding cash and doing that. Never has there been a discussion on this board in the numerous years I've been here, I won't even make a number because I'll, I'll make a wrong one, where we had any conversation whatsoever talking about hoarding cash or frankly even building the reserve, okay? I, I really don't think there's ever been one discussion where we talked about building the reserve, okay? We're very fortunate to have built those reserves, okay? And, and we're very fortunate to be in this position where we can essentially pay cash for these big projects, okay? But I, I need to make it clear that we have never talked about hoarding cash, we have never talked about building the reserves. So, I mean, there's never been an idea that we would like build it back up uh, because we never really had a strategy to build it in the first place, okay? I mean, some of these are the unanticipated events that they come with, you know, revenue a little higher than anticipated, spending a little bit favorable than anticipated. And over the years, we've been narrowing that gap, I think. Um, but um, it just never was part of the strategy. So when there was a surplus, the board simply chose not to spend it? Uh, and we absolutely chose not to spend it. What Dr. Lee said earlier, it, it's been a bedrock principle that we would not spend reserves, on, at least on a continuing basis, to fund any operating expenses. Because once you do that, once we find ourselves in a deficit position from an operating standpoint, you can't recover because you're already maximizing your levy capped by inflation, okay? And so you assume, I mean, with that levy capped that way, it's very difficult for us to control our expenses such that they wouldn't go up, let's say, at the rate of inflation without cutting programs or doing some of those things, okay? And so our ability to make up, let's say, if we were running a $5 million deficit, our ability to go from a $5 million deficit to a break-even is, is really not feasible without cutting programs, right? right? And once you start using reserves to do that, you're on that track, right? And that, that's why we've always said, and we've always had conversations when we did our budget reviews, we said, nope, we gotta go find a way to cut some spending pretty much as we go, okay? And so we've done that over the years. That's why we cut the administrative um, Headcount, right, by about twenty percent. Uh, uh, yeah, five hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So. And this is something that the board has been talking about since I've been on the board in May, and before that. And pretty much since I've been on the board. It's yeah. really years. important to reiterate, yeah. as we are now on the precipice of moving yeah. forward with this project. And, and so thank you for, for clarifying. It really was important. A, I think it's important to, to realize that all these capital projects. I mean, I think there was a tipping point here. Okay. And it was really the Hawthorne experience, okay? Because we had done demographic surveys for a number of years, and I, I think for a while there was little evidence, really, that the population growth demographics were such that we were going <coughs> to need to add space in Vernon Hills and Liberty. And that's why, I don't know, now it's probably five years ago that you guys first asked for a gym, and we said, I, I just don't see it, okay? But I think what's happened over the last two years in particular, I mean, I, I know when I get challenged on this in the community, it's real easy for me to say, well, there's one thing we know for sure. The kids are in the school at home, and they're coming our way. Okay, this isn't some model, this isn't some projection. They're in seats, okay? In fact, they're in trailers. Um, 
So, you know, I think that was really what sort of lit the fire under this. We kind of said, hey, if we don't move, we're going to go to the village board and we're going to say, we need to put some double wines in the parking lot. You know, these kids are going to have to run inside to go to the restroom when it's 20 degrees below zero. None of these would be good. I mean, and there's, and we talked about in, in the presentations that we did, we talked about the cost of waiting. Because if you take, you know, $54 million of projects and you say we're going to delay that a year at 6% construction inflation, which seems to run about like college tuition inflation, you know, it doesn't run like, be in line with CPI. And you start doing the math on that, I mean, you're into millions of dollars of additional payments because you waited a year or two years or three years for something that, we were going to end up doing. So again, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, we appreciate the board's patience as we've had these conversations. You know, for the folks that have been on the board here in the pad gym for a longer period of time, and certainly for those of you that are newer in more recent times, as we've kind of worked our way through this. And I think we're in a really good place. I know we feel really good about it. I know you feel really good about it. So this will start that process moving, and we can make sure that we hit the construction cycle so we don't have to wait a year. Um, you know, to get rolling at, at both of the campuses. So with that said, Pat, I think. Are you, anybody else got any questions? Any other questions? I know you guys, any comments from the, no? <laughs> Ready to go. Okay. Let me just make one more question. I'm gonna make sure I heard it right. So let's assume we go forward on the, on the timeline we're talking about. We, we authorized one to get the biz, we get the biz next month, and then we rock and roll from there. We're talking about the LHS old pool being renovated by spring 2020. That's a year from now. Correct. Yes. A little more. Okay, and then more. And Just then to be clear, spring goes until about June. Yeah. So it's. it's I got it. Um, so no, I, I, get, I, get, I get that. But I mean, let, look. By the time we get the bids approved, it's it's basically March. Okay, so we're we're already running out of spring pretty soon. Right. Um, and then, VHHS, all of the work we're doing there, fall of all twenty twenty. Fall of twenty twenty. Okay, so. It just sounds like it could be a little aggressive. I love it. It'd be great. Um, but you guys are still good with that? Oh, yeah. We're good. Yeah. Yes, that's For sure. That's why we're here. John, John has already been meeting with his team because there's going to be a lot of logistics yeah. required because they're going to have to do some construction in the staff, you know, because you've got to have a bacteria. So they're already working on logistics. These guys are still good. They're solid. Every week we meet with them. and. Yeah, All you gotta do is get rolling. I mean, I guess I need the thing to remind ourselves: this is the single biggest thing we have endeavored to achieve and since we, we built this high school. And we will. Okay. Yeah, I'm confident we will. But it's. I, it's I, I, I think I think I put a motion for it quite a while ago. Yes. Okay. That's <laughs> <laughs> a motion. Well, I opened it up for further discussion. I want to make sure all the wishes are right. Can you get that chili over there by the window? It's getting cold yeah. by the window. Yeah. 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 I'm looking at the rest of the window. I'm looking at the rest of the window. We're going to rock and roll through this. All right. Any other comments or questions? No? Roll call, please. Baxter? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Kessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Moose? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rudy? Aye. I think Dorothy's about to blow the candles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. My back's to it, so. Oh my gosh. Is that win? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Boy requests. So we're bidding. Let's go. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, FOIA request. Uh, we have a series of requests here, and as you know, I'm re I'm actually required to read this into the record now. So uh, forgive me. This is a little bit longer, but I'll try and move through this. On 12 uh, 10 18, we received a uh, request from Amanda Marquez. All emails to and from the Castro, Chris Castro, Ma Marquez family, and staff from July 10 2016 to January 1 2017. Uh, asking please to not include any student uh, to teach um, versus contacts. Uh, response um, requesting clarification was made on 12-11-18. Deadline was 12-7-18. Clarification received on 12-11-18. Um, items 1 and 3 of request were denied. Item 2 requested uh, clarification that re working with council that response date was 12-17. On 12-17-18 and 12-19-18, Amanda Marquez, Chris Marquez, and Matt Marquez, uh, six uh, requests were submitted on December 17th, sent over five separate emails. Uh, number one, all communication to Chris Castro from Nora Castro to include email, phone call, transcripts, notes, 
from 6 6 to 18 to October 16, 2018. 2A. All communication to include email, notes, phone records, transcripts, etc., from Nora Castro to Susan Lampert and Associates, uh, P.S. Patel Pascula from June 5th, 2018 to December 14th, 2018, and any emails that use the name Marquez during that time. 2B, all legal action taken against E128 during that same time period, please redact any student names. 3, all communication from Nora Castro to include email, phone call, transcripts, notes, etc., cetera, from um, 6, 6, 2018 to September 6, 2018, not to include any student to teacher communications. Four, all emails, phone records, or any communication to and from Nora Castro from June 10th, 2016 to July 10th, 2016. Five, all communication of any kind from Nora Castro from September 14th to November 30th, 2018 is amended on December 19th. Uh, you can exclude uh, student to teacher communication, notification of staff meetings, or employee benefit communications. Two new separate email requests were submitted on December 19th. All communications from Nora Castro between June 10th, 2016 to July 10th, 2016 do not include duplicate emails or emails to students. You may send them electronically to this email. Uh, I am sure my sister told you we would all be requesting items weekly. One month cannot be unduly burdensome. All communication to include phone conversations or transcripts, emails, text, notes, mail, carrier pigeon, if applicable, etc. from Nora Castro between May 15, 2018 and June 15, 2018. Do not include student records, do not include emails that are the same. Like duplicates sent to multiple people unless there is a response. With all that said, uh, the response was a voluminous request, an invitation to amend this request was done on 12-21-18. The deadlines were 12-24-18 and 12-27-18. We received no response. Final response was denied and unduly burdensome. Uh, that was sent on what, working with count, our council, 114.19. Total time spent on all Marquez requests, 20 hours. On 12.13.18, Bethany Simpson uh, from Smart Procure, uh, electronic record of purchase orders dated 9.13.18 to current 115.19, including purchase order number, purchase date, Line item details, line item quantity, line item price, vendor ID, name and address. Response date was 115.19. Uh, commercial response date deadline was 115.19. Time spent on this one was uh, one hour. Uh, that was Rose DeSico that handled that request for us. 115.19, uh, Nathan Mihalik from the Illinois Retired Teachers Association requested names and email addresses of all teachers or administrators who are retiring in 2019. Brian handled that response. Uh, response date was 118.19. Uh, our deadline was 123.19, and time spent on that request was a half an hour. And Pat, uh, that concludes the FOIA request. Um, okay, next on the superintendent's report, we have done an extensive review of um, in our uh, semi and or review of uh, closed session minutes. We are recommending the board that we release no, um, uh, none, no or none of the closed session minutes uh, this time. And so um, if uh, the board so agrees to that, Pat, uh, then we do not need to go into closed session to, unless you all want to discuss one of them, of course. Just a quick question for clarification. Sure. Our attorney continues to recommend these remain closed. Correct. Right. Thank yep. you. Okay, so we can we can do that vote here then, correct? Yes. Okay, is there a motion to uh, uh, keep the uh, closed session minutes confidential? I motion to keep the closed session minutes confidential. Second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Russell? Aye. Huber? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Batson? Aye. All right, hey, okay, Pat. Back to you. Thank you, sir. All right, the consent vote agenda is listed. We reviewed it earlier in the month. Is there a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed? I move to uh, approve the consent vote agenda as listed. Second. Any discussion? If not, roll call, please. Russell? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce, Aye. Lundstedt, Aye. Rudy, Aye. Batson, Aye. Rudy. Aye, motion carries. All right, Civilian and Finance Committee, Chairperson Luce. Okie dokie. Okay. We have summer school transportation fee. Yeah, just as we discussed in committee, um, looking at our, our fee, our cost per our 
Uh, we did auto transportation last year. That cost went up 25 percent, and uh, which would include our suburb school transportation. So therefore, uh, looking at our fee to see if there's a corresponding increase. Currently, the current fee is $45. Has been there for several years. Um, uh, just looking at it, I, don't, I personally didn't feel that a 25 percent increase in that fee. Um, would, would be something I would recommend at this time. Um, however, I do think going from the 45 to 50, I think is is a good balance. This doesn't come really close to paying for it. It's it's honestly more of just a just to help offset the cost of summer school transportation. So we're looking for a motion to move the fee from 45 dollars to 50 dollars. I move right. to uh, increase the summer school transportation fee from 45 dollars to 50 dollars. Second. Any discussion? Uber. Aye. Moose. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. All right, motion carried. And <coughs> under other. We are good. All right, program and personnel. Okay, we have a couple items here. We have board policies for a second reading and adoption. I don't think we need to go through these in any detail. They've uh, been reviewed both uh, for first reading at the last board meeting and during committee meetings. So, uh, and there hasn't been any, Brian, there has not been any changes, changes no uh, adjustments or anything. Nope. So uh, I think we'll just uh, look for a motion uh, to approve these. I move to approve the listed board policies after second reading and adoption. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, roll call please. Moose? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hassel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Okay, we have uh, a couple of employment of employees um, yeah, as listed. There's an after Looking for a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. I move to approve the employees as listed. Second. Any questions, comments for the discussion? No? Okay, <laughs> roll call, please. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. And one final item, an additional uh, educational tool request that came in after the uh, consent agenda was uh, put together. So we have the Junior State of America Winter Congress in Washington, D.C. for Vernon Hills. Um, we have a motion for that. So moved. Second. Any comments, questions? Okay, roll call please. Rudy? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Castle? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Thank you. Anything under other for anybody? Okay. Uh, that concludes the uh, our Thank program you. with personnel. Thank you. No property uh, sealed into the. Okay. They sell it. Uh, see all. Uh, as the board knows, Seedall, um, Special Ed District of Lake County, uh, settled their contract with their employees. So that's all we have to do. Are they included? Yep. Yeah. All right. And ISB was nothing? Nothing. Okay. So again, there's no executive session tonight, so we don't need to do that or return to open session. So with that, is there a motion? Anything else? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Move, move. I move to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.